Good morning. Um, I guess I should start by saying thank you to the people that invited me, although you might have a different opinion by the time I've finished. Um, I came to this conference four years ago and it was absolutely brilliant, very exciting because it was London 2012 and uh, it's very exciting to be here today. Um, I imagine my talk will be somewhat different to some of the others you'll hear today. Um, I thought I would introduce myself for those of you that don't know me. Um, so I am a director in pharma R&D at GlaxoSmithKline. Um, my areas of interest are all around very nerdy data computational related stuff, although my, my um, background is in exercise physiology. So um, heavens only knows how I ended up doing what I do now. Um, but I do a lot of modeling. Uh, these days, mainly modeling of data. So I work with very large data sets and, and high dimensional analytics, but I still do a fair bit of modeling biology or mechanistic modeling. Um, so that's me. So I was going to start with this perhaps somewhat contentious question about what is systems biology. There are a lot of definitions. This is mine. Um, I just thought I'd muddy the waters still further. Um, but this is a sort of somewhat a consensus now. So it's mainly around the idea of having an iterative process. So where you gather data and you model it and then the model leads you to need more data, so you go back and you gather more data and you return to your model. And I guess the two key elements I would put in here are the iterative nature um, and the modeling. So I would, I would argue that systems biology, to be true systems biology, requires a computational model of some kind in the middle of it. And that omics methods, while they are a big part of what systems biology is, they aren't by themselves systems biology. Um, one of the nicest examples I know of is this paper from 1977 in Science, Mackie and Glass. Uh, students that are here, I thoroughly recommend going and having a look at this. They built a very simple mathematical model of feedback control of respiration. Uh, the equation's just here. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and what they showed was that if you push this simple model beyond its normal bounds, um, without sort of breaking anything, you see something called chain stokes respiration, which is a type of sort of periodic breathing that you see at high altitude and also in people who are close to death. So it was one of these emergent properties you hear so much about. Um, and it's, it's a really lovely paper. Why do we need it now? Um, because biology is incredibly complicated. I mean, I know that you know that, but really, <laughs> It's really complicated. Uh, this is human central carbon metabolism. This is toll-like receptor signaling. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is a transcriptional network in E. coli. Um, and I guess the, the point of this is, if something as simple as that equation describing feedback control of respiration is capable of producing behavior that you can't predict, how much more likely is it that you'll see emergent properties in systems as complicated as this one? And this is going to be orders of magnitude more complicated in human signaling networks. It's not new, by the way. Uh, a guy called Ludwig von Bertalanffy wrote a very good book called General Systems Theory, I think back in the 50s and 60s. I'm not going to read out this quote of his, but basically he points out mathematically that um, if you pull something apart into its constituents' parts and put the parts back together again, there has to be a fairly simple relationship with, between those parts for them not to do anything unexpected. And, I kind, I kind of feel like I'm preaching to the choir in a room, physiology, uh, room full of physiologists because we kind of know this already, right? That even relatively simple systems will do unexpected things and you can't rely on studying the bits to know how the whole thing will behave. And so we have integrative physiology. But you'd be surprised how often this kind of idea gets forgotten. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, a modeling approach that some of you may be familiar with, um, but I suspect not so many. Uh, it's called constraint-based modeling. Um, I came across it, I guess, about five years ago when uh, I was doing a lot of metabolomics and I was looking for a computational framework that would sit at the center of that systems biology paradigm that I was talking to you about. So a type of modeling that allowed me to combine lots of different data types. It, was, it allowed me to be iterative in the way that we combine that data. 
But most of all, I wanted something that wasn't going to violate assumptions that would, you know, make my teeth itch as a biologist. Just I wanted something that I felt like I could, I could be comfortable with using. And so I always say this, but I would encourage you to shoot holes. So if you find holes or assumptions that are violated that you're not happy with, please do, you know, raise it because it's important we figure this stuff out. So two, two or three quick slides to describe it. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail in, in, in the methods here, but, um, but I can do as well. If you want to come and find me later, I can talk it through with you. But basically, there are two steps to what's done here. So the first thing is the reconstruction of a network. Um, and there are a number of ways that you can do this, but effectively what you're trying to do is you're trying to get a parts list. So um, there is a human metabolic network reconstruction. If you've come across it, it's a very impressive piece of work scientifically. The first version, Recon 1, was published in PNAS, I think, in 2009. And Recon 2, which is the second revision, was published in Nature Biotechnology, I think, last year or the year before. And they really are spectacular pieces of scientific, collaborative scientific work. Um, and for those large reconstructions, the steps are pretty simple. You take the best annotated genome you have, you pull out all the genes that have been annotated as being related to metabolism, you dig into the scientific literature and you figure out what reactions are associated with that, in particular you're after the stoichiometry. And that's a key feature of this type of modelling is we're not talking about kinetic modelling. I'll come to this in a minute, but the, the type of modelling that you might be more familiar with where you see time courses, um, when you model metabolism in that way, or anything in that way, I guess one of the problems that you come up against is establishing rate constants in vivo. Um, a lot of the rate constants we use have been, have been measured under um, laboratory conditions, and they can be quite different, and they're very difficult to measure in, in, in vivo. So once you've put those bits together, uh, you end up with a matrix, and it's actually a very simple thing to do, but like I said, I'm not going to go into the details here. And so the first kind of key point in this is that once you've done that, and if, you, you know, if you're really thorough about how you derive your information, you have, in a mathematically tractable format, the sort of state-of-the-art information about the connectivity of your metabolic network, which in itself is a pretty awesome thing, right? Um, oh, I'm getting muddled up here. The thing that you can do next, though, which is quite cool, is you can then apply data on top of that. So, for example, you can use transcriptomics, to measure the expression of these genes. And if the gene isn't expressed, then you can assume pretty safely that the protein's not there and you can take it out of your network. And by doing that, you can generate these context-specific network reconstructions in a fairly straightforward way, right? And so that's this picture here. And, and as you do that, you can include other data. So you can include fluxomic data. Um, you can include sort of simple physiological measurements of, of uh, oxygen uptake, for example, into your model. You can include all of that, and then you have this condition-specific model in which you can run simulations, and those simulations might help you formulate other questions that you go back and ask, and there you go. You've got your kind of iterative um, process with a model in the middle. So you start with an annotated genome. You can start with other parts lists. So you can start using sort of combi combinations of proteomics and transcriptomics if you want to go straight for your tissue-specific model. Um, and once you get your parts connected, I'd like to show this slide just to kind of another use for Excel that you never thought. Uh, it, it, this is um, the mitochondrial reconstruction that I've used quite a lot. And so you can see here, this is a nice kind of example right away. This is the name of the reaction. Uh, this is the description of the reaction, and this is basically what forms the, the, the center of the reconstruction itself. And even the mitochondrial network is kind of complicated, so this is just a graphic representation. The bits aren't disconnected like they appear here. They've just been pulled apart to make it easier to see, but there are obviously multiple connections between all these parts of the mitochondrial network. So, as I promised you, a quick contrast between this type of approach and the kinetic approaches that you might be more used to. So the maths is slightly different. We're dealing with linear algebra here. Um, now the key thing, I guess I would say, is that this type of modeling doesn't give you a single answer. It doesn't describe the kind of, the way that the metabolism or the network you're modeling behaves across time. Instead what it does is it sort of defines the space within which the cell has to function. There's a sort of key thing here that I haven't mentioned, but um, having built your reconstruction, another very important part of the sort of construction of the model is putting in what we call constraints, hence the name constraint-based modeling. And these actually for physiologists are things that come very naturally. VO2 max is a natural constraint. So that is 
the, the maximum amount of oxygen that can go into your system or the maximum amount of oxygen that the, that the organism can use under specific conditions, maximum glucose uptake, for example, these are all typical constraints that you would apply to a model like this. And once you've applied those constraints and you have your network joined up, the final assumption that, that we often work with is a steady state assumption or a quasi steady state assumption. And what we're looking for is we're looking for distributions of flux throughout this network that satisfy all these constraints. So basically you can't exceed the amount that goes in, you can't exceed the amount that goes out, and everything basically has to balance up so ultimately you get steady state flux through the network. In my head I imagine those kind of Roman water networks that we used to see as kids when we were at school, that everything has to kind of work out in order for, the, for, for this to work. So there are two ways that you can assess that because what you have then is you have this space within which the cell can function. And the cell will choose one specific combination of fluxes that satisfy those constraints at any given time. Now, I argue that it's, it's kind of an interesting exercise to figure out why a cell chooses one option over another. Um, but we analyze this space in two different ways. So one of them is something called flux balance analysis that you might have come across before. And what that looks for is you sort of push out to the edges of the space. So, for example, you say, if I wanted to maximize ATP production, how would I do that? And actually, you can show mathematically that that takes you to a corner, something like that, a corner of this space, and you look to see what happens, and you can look to see, for example, what's limiting that behavior. So is there something where you can kind of increase a flux somewhere and you push VO2 max up a bit more, right? The other thing that you can do is just randomly sample the space to sort of describe what's available. And when you do that, you get these things that look like probability distributions. So you get, you know, the most likely point where this, this, this enzyme is going to be sitting in terms of fl a flux rate is here. And you'll see results that look um, like that. Now, one of the key differences between this and kinetic modeling is the scale of what you can model by, by sort of getting away from the, the rate constant. So with um, systems of differential equations, the way you would normally model metabolism, I guess you would get eight, ten reactions with stuff stuck on before you start to feel uncomfortable about overfitting. Uh, using methods, constraint-based methods, you can model thousands and thousands of reactions simultaneously on a laptop computer. So you can model the entire metabolism of a cell or tissue um, and actually multiple cell. There are multiple cell organisms that describe, for example, liver and muscle or liver, muscle and adipocyte metabolism. So it's possible to, 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 to build these very large network reconstructions and run simulations across them without having you know, absurd amounts of compute power. So very exciting. And they've been used for lots and lots of different things. Uh, network topology is a very interesting one. So that's just kind of looking at how things are linked up, what bits of the network might be essential to its normal functioning. It doesn't really require any assumptions at all for that to work. Gap analysis, I, I'm not going to go into details now because I haven't got time, but it's a very nice way of looking to see which bits of your network should be there but aren't. And there was a very nice paper, I think, also in Nature Biotechnology a few years ago where that approach was used to uncover a load of open reading frames in the human genome that hadn't been annotated yet. Uh, simulation and hypothesis generations, that's mostly what I'm going to talk about today. Modeling of multi-tissue systems, I mentioned a second ago. Mapping and integration of trans-hierarchical data, very exciting. So taking multi-omics data and incorporating it into a single model. And drug target ID, I had to get that in somewhere. Um, so, some examples. So I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, the first one is related to an experiment run in Manuel Mayer's lab. I don't know if you guys know Manuel, but he's a cardiac proteomics and metabolism guy at King's. Um, and he was looking at pahexylin, which is a fatty acid uptake inhibitor. And the reason we got talking is because the experimental results in mouse heart, this is healthy mouse heart from pahexylin, were not what was expected. So he was expecting that if you inhibit fatty acid metabolism, you would get increases in glycolysis. He hadn't seen that, uh, but he'd seen some other kind of complicated and, and, and tricky to interpret changes in the proteome. And so we started talking. I said, well, you know, I'll model it. And um, one of the great things about modeling is you have to pick your fight slightly. And, and pehexin is an easy thing to model because you just reduce the amount of fatty acids that the model uptakes. That's another reason I like hypoxia. It's very easy to model. Um, so this rather offensive colour chart um, is actually a kind of quantized heat map. So, and again, I know some people like green to be go and red to be stop, but we've sort of agreed that red is up and green is down. And so this is across all the reactions in the mitochondrial network that I showed you when I did a very simple simulation of reducing fatty acid uptake, what happened. Um, 
So the first thing that you can kind of see here is that in lots of glycolysis, nothing changes, um, which was quite surprising. Um, actually, the first thing that you'd notice is that everything to do with fatty acid transport and activation goes down. So that's really good news, right? We'd be, we'd be gutted if that hadn't happened. Glycolysis is relatively unchanged, but there is some action here, particularly in and around the TCA cycle. So you can see here, this is span one of the TCA cycle was pushed up, uh, was pushed down, sorry. Span two of the TCA cycle was pushed up. Uh, Oxfos was inhibited, kind of again, as you'd expect. And these are just some kind of specific examples of that. So this is from random sampling. So this kind of, uh, these are these probability distributions I was telling you about. So glucose uptake, it's a modeling convention that uptakes are negative numbers and positive numbers, effluxes, just so you know. So this is glucose uptake was about the same. Uh, glutamine uptake was stimulated. These are all simulations. Uh, lactate uptake was stimulated. And uh, PDH activity was up. So... Um, how did this marry up with the, oh, sorry, this is one of those pretty figures that we do like generating, but it's basically the same thing. So you can see that the two spans of the TCA cycle were differently regulated. And I guess this as well takes you away from that kind of thinking that the TCA cycle is a cycle. It can be separated out into, into different bits. So when we went and looked at the data that Manuel had, it was incredibly consistent. Actually, the, sorry, before I go on, there's one small point I'd like to make here as well, is that you end up using words like repatterning a lot if you do this stuff. And that's because it, it, it is complicated and everything's interconnected and it becomes very difficult to kind of describe what's going on in a single um, pithy tagline. So you end up with reprogramming and repatterning. But actually it sort of speaks to that thing I said earlier on about the Roman water course is that if you poke these complicated systems, what tends to happen is the effects of that will ripple out through the entire system. You'll see changes all over the place. Um, and so what we found as well is experimentally, this was very consistent with what Manuel had, had seen. So PDH activity was up, LDH was up, but we don't think that's because it was shipping lactate out. We think it was because it was pulling it in. And actually they found when they looked at the metabolomics and the proteomics alongside each other that their glutamate and succinate were correlated, suggesting that there was some relationship between that amino acid and span two of the TCA cycle. So generally speaking, the modeling did a very, very good job of explaining what was going on. So... Here's another example. I'm not going to give you the hypoxia spiel because I imagine, again, applied physiologists will get that already, but it is fantastically exciting and interesting, and I've been involved in it. I'm involved in the extreme Everest thing and have been since 2005. Um, so, again, hypoxia is a very easy thing to model, uh, and so I took the mitochondrial model again, and I was interested in, in, in just looking in the first instance to see what happened if we just reduced uh, oxygen availability in this model. And in this case, I'm using both techniques. I'm using the, the sampling, the random sampling of the space, as well as flux balance analysis. And the, way I, the reason I say that is because A is flux balance analysis and B is sampling. Um, I'm not going to go into details why you don't see glycolysis up here, but it's basically because flux balance analysis maxes out pathways. So under the two conditions, glycolysis was always maxed out, so you don't see any difference in hypoxia, if that makes sense. You do see it when you sample because you're not sort of pushing the system to its limits, and there you see glycolysis increase. Um, so from the random sampling, one of the first things that you notice is this, which I think is kind of fascinating from a biology perspective, and that's that reducing oxygen availability just massively reduces the space to operate that the cell has metabolically. So the red dots there are in hypoxia, the green dots are in normoxia. And so, you know, the, the room, wiggle room, if you like, metabolically is, is reduced in every direction pretty much by taking the oxygen away. So the next thing that you notice here is up in this corner is phospholipid biosynthesis. And no matter how you run the simulations, phospholipid synthesis is increased in hypoxia, which seemed like a slightly odd thing to observe. Um, I went and dug into the literature, and actually there's, uh, there's some very good support for this. And, and what we think is happening here is the kind of ugly cousin of lipotoxicity, really, um, where rather than... Um, uh, seeing sort of fatty acid overload of the mitochondria, mitochondrial oxidation is reduced due to the lack of oxygen. The, the model and the cell have to maintain steady state. It can't stop the fatty acids from, it can regulate them to some extent, but it can't completely stop them coming into the cell. And so what it does is it ships them off elsewhere just to kind of, you know, block the gap for the time being. And, and, and that one store is, is uh, phospholipid biosynthesis. So very quickly, Actually, this sort of just 
increased confidence a little bit that, that this technique was giving us something interesting. And it so happened that I had uh, access to some other very interesting data about SNPs in Tibetans who've been living up high for a very long time. And it got me and uh, Hugh Montgomery as well sort of asking this question that if you treat evolution as an optimization process and we can optimize using mathematical methods like flux balance analysis, uh, things like ATP production uh, in the model, do the two end up at the same place? So does mathematical optimization and evolutionary optimization converge? And it just seemed like a kind of neat thing to try. Um, so the technique that I used actually for, the, um, for looking for genes or reactions that were likely to be under selective pressure using computational methods was this thing called flux bands. And effectively what that is is when you optimize for ATP synthesis with oxygen reduced, what are the reactions where the wiggle room is very small? So what are the ones where if you change it a little bit, it would have a very profound effect on ATP synthesis and hypoxia? And we sort of hypothesized that these would be the ones that would be under selective pressure because any loss of function or gain of function in those reactions is likely to have a very dramatic effect on ATP synthesis. And actually when we looked at the SNPs in genes that were very highly selected for in Tibetans over 10,000 years or so of living up high versus the ones that were selected by uh, these computational methods, we actually saw some very good agreement. And you really see it when you look at it from the perspective of the genes, because obviously the genes and the reactions are not a one-to-one -one relationship. So actually 50% of the genes in the top 20 um, were correctly predicted by the model. So really fantastic outcome, which we enjoyed very much. Um, I've got a couple more seconds just to draw your attention to two papers. This is actually a pair of papers um, I saw this presented a few years ago at a very small conference in Iceland. Just knocked me off my feet. Such beautiful work. Again, I really encourage you to dig up the papers. The two papers were one in Molecular Systems Biology, which is Nature's uh, Systems Biology paper, and then, uh, sorry, journal, and then one in Nature. And effectively, the same techniques as I've described to you today were used. Models were built of liver metabolism and then cancer cell metabolism. Um, and, and in the first instance, all that was happened was single deletions in silico. So all you do is you just take that reaction out of your network and see what happens to the sort of survivability of the cell. Um, I think there's some statistics here about, yeah, so when you do single gene deletions, they got 80% of FDA approved metabolic anti-cancer drugs. And the ones that they missed um, were ones that weren't within the scope of their model, so it really was a fantastic result. But the problem with that is a lot of those existing drugs uh, do have tox issues. Um, and so what they did is to try and improve specificity, they did pairwise deletions, which would be very, very difficult to do experimentally. And if you go to triplets, it's literally impossible because you get this exponential ex explosion in the number of experiments you have to do. So this was knock out two reactions where each one on its own would not be lethal to the cell, but the two together would be, right? And they identified a whole bunch of very interesting pairs. The one that they went and dug into in a lot more detail was this comb combination of fumarate hydrotase and heme oxygenase. And the reason that's interesting is because um, lots of tumor cells are missing fumarate hydrotase. In fact, it's a common oncogenic mutation. And it was sort of not really understood how cells that were missing a key TCA cycle enzyme could do so well. So these guys showed that actually uh, the cancer cells were able to find a rat run that leads to bilirubin synthesis. It goes via heme oxygenase, and if you knock heme oxygenase out, the cells are done for. And they were able to confirm that experimentally. This is uh, renal cell carcinoma cells with a heme oxygenase inhibitor added. And again, it was a, it was a really nice paper. Um, I'm running out of time a little bit, so this is the last slide. This is toll-like receptor signaling. Signaling is not quite so well um, fleshed out with these approaches, but this is Ines Thiele, who's a, who's a collaborator of mine. And what they were able to use it for, actually, was in a very complicated interacting network like TLR signaling, they were able to dissect out the functional modules. So what you're after here, I guess, is trying to figure out if I want to affect this arm of the signaling network without affecting this function of it, where should I aim to poke? And they were able to do that computationally. Um, and again, a sort of key thing here is a lot of these guys are going back and confirming these experimentally. They're not just publishing the computational results. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, again, like I'd say, I, I would encourage you all, if, you've, if this has sort of alarmed you, to come and talk to me. If it's excited you, definitely please come and talk to me. Um, thank you to everybody that's been involved in the work. Uh, and thank you to King's for supporting me while I did a lot of this before I moved to Glaxo. Thank you. <laughs>